It's the Score North Twin Show. There's the burner right there. We're not going to do the hot stove stuff on this episode, even though Noah Syndergaard is being rumored as a Twins target. Right? right Noah there. Syndergaard? What is he? How old is he now? Thor. 30, 31, too. His arm's like 87. That's yeah. what I thought. It felt like... 31. Yeah. He's only 31. I would have thought 52. He's he four months older than me. Fell off like three years ago. They just, he just kept pitching. So we will. Doogie had an update on some uh, on the Minnesota sports with Mackie and Judd scoop session. You can find some twins nuggets toward the back end of that. But we are here today to finish off the top 25 twins of all time. According to me, you guys can argue it as much as you want here. We've spent the last few weeks unveiling five at a time. And for this episode, for those of you playing catch up, we will go through 25 up to five and then we'll unveil five through one. And I know Judd's already been like, especially like 11 through 15 and maybe even 16 through 20. He's taken issue with some of these. So we can spar it out once the list is. Yeah. Complete. I think the last list that you did, which was what? Six through or six, through, six 10. through 10. I think that's the one where I uh, suggested that we actually have an episode to break this down. Pretty okay. sure I was fine up until 10. Okay. So we will, uh, we will have that sparring session and we will unveil here the top five twins of all time. Presented by our friends at Zero Res, gentlemen. When's the last time you did something other than just vacuum your house or maybe a light dusting? Okay, that's where I was. In fact, I was driving around yesterday getting lunch with our uh, our guy Manny Hill, uh, producer on Score North back in the day, and still works for uh, Fifteen Hundred ESPN. And I was driving behind a Zero Res van, and I thought about pulling up alongside and like, "Hey guys, we love having you on our shows," but they probably wouldn't have known what I was talking about. So. Just- no, they would have probably Hi, called everybody. the cops hey. and reported <laughs> your license plate. Why is this doofus waving at us? So Zero Res is here to deep clean your home. You can get three rooms Zero Resified starting at just $119 and a free hallway as well. And $75 off when you get your air ducts Zero Res clean. That's 9520res or ZeroResMinnesota.com. 9520res or ZeroResMinnesota.com. Ask for the Score North special to get those things spelled forward or backward. It spells the same. Zero Res. Okay, we unveiled, well, honorable mentions, we'll throw these guys out. This is going all the way back like a month ago. Mudcat Grant, Eddie Gordado, and Michael Kadire were honorable mentions. They did not make the top 25. Mm-hmm. I would even say like Corey Kosky came pretty close. Really underrated, sneaky underrated player for the Twins. Yeah. So he was kind of in that mix too. Mm-hmm. 25, and I did consult with two former Twins general managers who I said, hey, am I, like, omitting anything glaring? Am I Do I have somebody that's misranked by, like, five spots? And they both said they had a couple little qualms, but they both said, okay, it's pretty good. You're not yeah, embarrassing not yourself completely with not this bad. list. Mm-hmm. So 25, Brad Radke. 24, Earl Batty. One of the uh, great catchers in early Twins history. Four-time All-Star in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Jim Perry, the 1970 Cy Young Award winner for the Twins. Good one. Number 22, Greg Gagne, one of the great defensive shortstops in baseball during his time. And number 21, Cesar Tovar, the ultimate jack-of-all-trades player for the 1960s Twins. Number 20, Bob Allison, just rock-solid power hitter, corner outfield staple, two-time All-Star. Number 19, Joe Nathan, the Twins' all-time saves leader. Number 18, Rick Aguilera, second all-time in saves, but a better postseason career with the Twins than Joe Nathan, so I put him above Joe Nathan. Fair. 17, he's estranged from the organization, but uh, Chuck Knobloch had seven really good seasons with the Twins. Rookie of the year in 91, four-time All-Star, his 1996 season, one of the best individual season performances in club history. And number 16, the rat, Gary Gaetti. One of the best defensive third basemen of his era, four-time goal glover, 200 career home runs as a twin. 15, Camilo Pasquale. I think the first great starting pitcher in Twins history, like a good a three- to four-year stretch, one of the best starting pitchers in baseball. Yep. Number 14, Zoilo Versailles, the 1965 American League MVP. Number 13, Frankie Sweet Music Viola, 
the 1988 American League Cy Young Award winner, also pitched game games one and seven of the 1987 World Series, 16 combined innings, and gave up only three runs in those two victories for the Twins. Mm-hmm. Number 12, Torrey Hunter. And number 11, only one year as a twin, but the most legendary pitching performance in Major League Baseball history, Jack Morris. Not in the Twins. Hall of Fame, as we discussed. We got to change that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number 10, Justin Morneau, the 2006 American League MVP. Would have been really interesting to see his 2010 season play out without the concussion. He was the best hitter, maybe the best player in baseball at the halfway mark. Number nine, Kent Herbeck, 14 years as a twin, one of the centerpieces of two World Series teams, second all-time on the Twins' home run list, just a model of consistent offensive performance. Number eight, the same thing, but on the pitching side, Jim Cott, but two decades earlier, maybe a decade and a half earlier. 1966, led the majors with 41 starts, complete games, innings, top five MVP, Uh, 12-time Gold Glove Award winner, too. He could field his position, Jim Cott. Mm -hmm. Number seven, Burt Blylevin. Two stints as a twin. Dominant as a young pitcher, the first one, and then came around as the veteran who helped the Twins win a World Series in the mid to late 80s. Uh, He's the all-time Twins leader in wins above replacement for a pitcher on the analytical side. And circled a lot of fans. Circled a ton of fans, yeah. His broadcasting career did not factor into these rankings. You are here by circle. Yeah. <laughs> Number six, Johan Santana, because I value peak greatness over longevity. And I think Johan Santana is the biggest Hall of Fame snub of my lifetime. Johan Santana, for a six or seven year stretch, was the best starting pitcher in all of baseball. Two Cy Youngs in 2004 and 2006 got screwed in 2005 when Bartolo Colon beat him out because he had more wins, even though Johan led 10 other categories, including ERA, strikeouts, you name well, it. And he he fell off the ballot immediately with less than 5% in his first year, right? Insane. That's the, that's the thing that gets me, is like, he's a, he's a Hall of Fame conversation, and he was dismissed completely. And if he would have picked up that third Cy Young, which he deserved in 2005, it would have tied him for fifth all-time in Cy Young Awards behind Roger Clemens, Randy Johnson, Greg Maddox, Steve Carlton. It would have tied him with Clayton Kershaw, Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, Pedro Martinez, Tom Seaver, Jim Palmer, and Sandy Koufax. Like, he would have been on the same list for Cy Youngs as first ballot Hall of Fame goats. Do you recall his only year on the ballot? I don't. Johan, it was two, year, two years ago? Probably Two or three years ago, yeah, if he retired in, like, 2013. I find it very odd that the current voters didn't get him above 5% just to stay on the ballot. I think this, if he was a first year this year, he would have he would have been fine. I think some of those new ones that have kind of hopped on the ballot, I think that would have pushed him over the 5 Okay, personally. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So just real quick here, 2019 Hall of Fame voting. I think it was 19. Yep, 19. he retired in 12. You retired. Uh, Twenty twelve was his last season. So one. seven. So it's five but he, years. But oh, did he? I thought he. But he like stopped and started. He went to camp with the Orioles at one point. Oh, did he? Okay. Okay. Eight. Two thousand eighteen was his first year on the ballot. Two point four percent. Right. That's, that's ten atrocious. votes, dude. That's atrocious. But that's what I'm asking. Like, do do we have in a relatively short time period? Do we have enough voters now where he stays on? Like, it's just weird to me that he didn't stay on. Well, how about this? Scott Rowland, that, that was Scott Rowland's first year on the ballot. He okay. only got 10% and then later mm-hmm. became a Hall of Famer. Oh, wow. Yep. Yep. Fred McGriff only got 23%, later became a Hall of Famer. So mm-hmm. Crime Dog deserves better than that, too. Yep. So, okay, I'll give you the top five and then you can fight me on all this. Yep. Okay? Yep. The fifth best twin in team history, Joseph Patrick Maurer. Okay. Recently inducted or at least uh, announced as a 2024 Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. Joe Maurer, three batting champions, uh, championships as a catcher, MVP in 2009. That 2009 season, one of the great seasons defensively and offensively in Twins history. Uh, one of the highest on base percentages in club history. 306 career batting average. And that does, you know, that's, 
that's like a five year drop off at first base too. If you just take the ten years as catcher, he's the best catcher in the history of the Twins. And you add on the accolades, the batting titles, the Gold Gloves, the MVP, the I believe uh, five Silver Slugger awards. Yep. And Joe Maurer is now the postseason success, not quite like some of the other Twins. Uh-huh. But I'm putting Joe Maurer in the top five among all time Twins. So I have, obviously, and I know Judd probably does too, and anyone keeping score at home, probably had the five guys that are left on this list. Because I have five the guy, five guys that are left on this list, and I was curious where Maurer was going to rank. I had one of them, and I'm a little surprised, but not shocked. Okay. I, thought there, I thought he would rank ahead of, for sure, one of the other four names that are now left on this list. I'll wait okay. to say that person. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it might be this one. Number four is Tony Oliva. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Tony Oliva also won three batting titles as a twin. Wow. His knee blew up when he was like 32 years old. So kind of similar to Maurer where you get to your early 30s, and then for Maurer it was a combination of different ailments. For Tony Oliva it was his knee. He did come back and play a handful of years, but very similar in that for for like a decade, for Tony Oliva it was probably an eight- or nine-year chunk. He was one of the best players in baseball. He was an eight-time All-Star Eight consecutive seasons of MVP votes, including second in two thousand in uh, nineteen sixty five, and second in nineteen seventy. Rookie of the year in nineteen sixty four, and then the knee injury derails him a little bit and uh, kind of creates this what if scenario. He also led the league in hits five different times, led the league in doubles four different times, led the league in slugging percentage in nineteen seventy one. Just a great all around player and defensive outfielder. Tony Oliva. Yeah, that's very solid. He is okay. definitely top five. Number three greatest twin of all time. Another Hall of Famer here. Harmon Killebrew. Oh, the old timers are going nuts. Yeah, they are. The old timers, I can hear them. I get it. I get it. Uh, twins all time leader in home runs. He led the majors in home runs six different times. MVP. In 1969, 49 home runs, 140 runs driven in. Yep. Led the league with a 427 on base. Uh, you want to talk about top of the mountain Twins power hitters. Harmon Killebrew stands atop. And also has the most clean and pristine autograph signature in Twins history. But that did not play a role in these <laughs> rankings. A little bit. His autograph is really so nice. So Plyler was circling you people who get him up higher? Yeah. <laughs> And so I get it, like Harmon Killebrew, if you just look at the numbers, um, you can make a strong case that he should be number one. And you can make the same case about number two, another Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. Rodney Carew, Mm -hmm. the second best player in Twins history. MVP in 1977. He was an all-star. He played in the league for 19 seasons, 12 with the Twins. He was an all-star every single year he was a Twin from his Rookie of the Year campaign in 1967 all the way up until 1978 when he eventually left for California. Uh, He was a seven-time batting champion with the Minnesota Twins. Starting at age 23 in 1969, he also received MVP votes in another, like, eight seasons aside from the year that he won the MVP. So Rod Carew, number two, and the number one player in Twins history, also a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer, Mm-hmm. For my money, Kirby Puckett. And I know that Kirby only has the one batting title. He doesn't have an MVP award. Uh, he, he never led the league in home runs. I get all that stuff. But as an all-around player, and when you factor in the clutchness, 1991, hop on my back, boys. I'm going to rob an extra base hit off the plexiglass. I'm going to hit a game-winning home run to see you tomorrow night. Gold Glove Awards in... Six different seasons, Silver Slugger Awards in six different seasons. Kirby Puckett is the best Twins player I ever saw with my own two eyes. And I'm putting him number one on this list. Also career shortened by at least a few years when he woke up blind in spring training in uh, the spring of 1996. So Kirby Puckett, number one. Puckett, Carew, Harmon Killebrew, Tony Oliva, and Joe Maurer round out the top five. Johan Santana, Burp Lylevin, Jim Cott, Kent Herbeck, Justin Morneau round out the top ten. Jack Morris, Tori Hunter, 
Frank Viola, Zoila Versailles, Camilo Pasquale get you to 15, and then Gary Gaetti, Chuck Knobloch, Rick Aguilera, Joe Nathan, Bob Allison, Cesar Tovar, 21, Greg Gagne, Jim Perry, Earl Batty, and Brad Racky. There's your top 25 twins of all time. Bravo. Crucify me in the comments. That's good stuff. Well, I think the old timers are going to crucify you on Killebrew, but those top three are incredible. So that's a very, I I think that depends on who who you saw play, when they played. The Pocket World Series stuff cannot be ignored. It just can't be, Um, which is why I think that I, I don't have a lot of quibbles here. I think it's a very solid list. Um, the only one I might m- move up based on the World Series is Viola from 13 a little bit. Not okay. near the top. Not not top five. You got to just saying you got to be specific, though. This, um, is the, this is the top 25, yep. man. Like we got to. Yep. So I'm probably moving Viola into my top 10. Wow. Let's see, you had a Jack Morris and two two game seven World Series starters right there. You know, based on based on the time that he spent here, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I would put him ahead of Jack. I would probably put him at number 10. I would probably move Morneau down into my 11 through 15. Sure. Um, But that's like one of my few quibbles, like, and it's not even a huge one. Uh, the top five, it, that's, the top three are hard. Like, yeah. I loved Carew, uh, but Puckett, you know, I can't, you can't ignore the World Series success. Killebrew was the first ever face of the franchise mm-hmm. and he made a World Series, but he didn't win it. So I, I have a hard time like trying to pick that apart and re- redo it. And I think that Maurer has proven now that he belongs. Kirby Puckett, real quick, because the postseason was a huge reason why, you know, he was a catalyst on two World Series winning teams. We talk about 1991 and the famous game six, hop on my back, right? In 1987, Kirby Puckett in the World Series batted 357 with a yeah. 419 on base percentage. Yeah. And played excellent defense in center field throughout that time, right? I mean, he, you, you can make a case he is the most popular Minnesota sports athlete of all time. Yeah, it's that's a fun exercise, but it's, it's man. Sure. KG's up there for sure. Randy Moss is up there. The 90s were a, a fruitful time for that exercise. So on the Mauro Oliva front, this is just like fascinating because it is splitting hairs basically on, on who you want to rank ahead of the other. I went back, looked at Mauer's numbers from 04 to 2013, and which is this, which this is also about like the same amount of games played. The war is nearly exactly identical. It just basically comes down to the MVP and what he did at his position. Maurer did is that does that trump what Oliva did at the plate? And Oliva won a Gold Glove once, but certainly was not a elite defensive player like Maurer was at his heyday at the most you know hardest position to do it at. But man, that's 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 what I was curious if you were going to rank Oliva or Maurer higher because they are very similar careers, similar situations with injuries. I would have personally ranked him ahead of Tony, but I wouldn't have yeah. fought anyone either if, if, what, if what you did. So I I dinged Joe for the postseason a little bit. So for the record, uh, Joe and Tony Oliva combined to play in seven postseason series, 0 for 7. They never, n- neither one of those guys ever got to uh, spray champagne after a postseason series. Right. Joe Maurer, 10 postseason games. 275 average, a 641 OPS. So he only had, uh, well, he had only one extra base hit in his postseason career. Probably should have had two, Phil Cuzzy. Give him two. Tony Oliva was a career 314 postseason hitter. And these are small sample sizes. We're talking 10 games and 13 games, so I get it. Uh, But Tony Oliva did a lot more damage in the postseason, even though they lost those series than Maurer did. So I I did weigh, boy, they're both really similar Mauer a little bit better on base guy. Oliva a little bit more power. You know, Mauer probably gets the edge position wise and defense, but then Oliva like postseason. I, I I wouldn't fight you on really if you wanted to flip flop those guys. Yeah. And then the other one for me, and I, I you know old timers again are probably just gonna murder me for this, but Zoilo Versailles, I know he has the absurd great MVP season, which isn't it's incredible. I mean, 45 doubles, 19 homers, 12 triples, gold glove shortstop. I get that, but if 
an MVP does weigh here. Like Justin Morneau won an MVP. Would Justin Morneau be this high if he didn't win the 06 MVP? Yep. But outside of that season, does he is he firmly in the top 15 players of all time? Yeah, it's it's how how do you weigh peak greatness? And I yeah. and that's where it comes in. Like that 1965 season, in which, by the way, he also hit a go-ahead home run in Game One of the World Series off Don Drysdale. Like, yeah, I'm I'm weighing that stuff mm-hmm. a yeah, little which, bit more. Like Gary Gaetti was really good for a longer period, but he wasn't as good in that one moment in that one season as Oliver Versailles. So that's why I have him a little. Yeah, high. and that that's why I, I said the one for me would probably to be to move Viola up into the top ten, into six through ten. You could make a case, I think, Declan, to what you're saying about Zoilo for flipping Zoilo and and Bob Allison. That's exactly mm. what I you would could, that, You could make that I'm looking case. at both. That that was the two things. Bob that Allison I would. was a great twin. So yeah. Bob Allison, we've got him at twenty. You could yeah. put him fourteen. You could move him up to that's so you you'd move him up maybe six spots there. So do you think Bob yeah. Allison's the biggest like the one that's misplaced the most on this list then? You put him above Gary Gaddy. He might be. Yes, probably. Yep. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, I think it's. I think it's. Allison. Closers are hard. It's like Aguilar and it's, Nathan. Yeah, I'm, totally I'm fine with those guys. Yeah, it's so I'm, tough. I'm yeah, fine with I them. Um, I think Allison or Viola, in my opinion, are are misplaced. And Frankie, just because he's outside of a top ten. Mm-hmm. When I tend to agree with, with you, especially in this godforsaken town, if you win a World Series, it's a you know. To me, yeah, yeah. Long, longevity is great and mm-hmm. should be recognized. But if you're a Minnesota champion, you move in my book a lot. Yep, that's and that's why that's why Jack Morris had to be high up for me. And that's we could debate up. like where do you put him? It's a great season though. It, and it, like, yeah, like it wasn't just that was, game. No, it, yeah, it was the whole year. He was like, wasn't he like top five in Cy Young voting? I mean, he yeah, was. He's a freaking bulldog. Like he pulled <laughs> off that whole season. Seriously. I mean, they don't win. If if you look at like the components there, if they had signed a different pitcher, there's a very good chance they don't win or get to that World Series. Mm-hmm. Like that's a real chance. I mean, Puckett, Morris, guys like that are, they completely changed the dynamic. And, and yeah. you know, keep in mind, in 87, you, you had Frankie. Frankie was fantastic. 91, you had Jack. And then and then guys like Tappany fall in line too. Like if, if you take Jack off that team and you go to Tappany and say, okay, Tap, we need more. How much more could Tappany give you? We need uh, 10 innings tonight. Yeah. I mean, Kevin Tappany <laughs> yeah. was really good, but I also think that that team really uh, fell into place well because guys were slotted correctly. Yeah. But good yep. list, dude. It's a fun the, list. I think like I, I wrestled over, to me, it was between Carew and Puckett for number one because you can't ignore Carew's accolades. You know, he was the fact that he he won the batting title and went to the All Star game almost every year. He was a twin, yep, which is insane. So, yeah. but I just can't get past. Part of it is I was born after Carew left. Right. So I never saw Carew play with my own eyes. I saw Puckett. I felt and experienced Puckett. Right. The 1991 World Series was my first baseball memory as a six year old. So it was hard for me to not put Kirby Puckett number one. Well, and that that's where, unfortunately, this entire show, aside from from Patrick when he joins us on Harmon, none of us saw him play. Yep. So, like, I know he was the face of the franchise. I've seen the highlights. I've seen all of that. But I don't have the appreciation for him as a player that, that like, I do for Puckett or Rodney. Yep. So, Yeah. Any other final thoughts on the the top? I, I have. So. There's another exercise that the audience would like us to do, which I'll bring up in a yeah, second. Yeah, where's Terry Tiffy? Oh, we just just missed the honorable mentions. He just missed, unfortunately. Yeah, I was looking for like potential snubs, and and I just went like mostly by team war or individual war with the team, and I went like all time hits leaders, and you have everyone on here that I feel like should be on here, so I, I can't really even find like a legit snub. Yeah. Maddie Tolbert. Maddie Tolbert probably should be on here. Nick Punto? Otis Nixon. I was a big Otis Nixon guy, man. On those 90s video games, too. Roberto the Braves Kelly? version. Roberto, Roberto Kelly. Kelly got the Twins had some base dealers in the 90s, man. Roberto oh, Kelly. Terry Ryan picked Knobloch. up every guy that hit the market for a while. 
Jose Offerman was a twin at one point, yes. wasn't he? Brent Gates. Uh, so somebody, let me find, I, I want to credit their name here because there's another exercise kind of close to this one, but it, but different enough that it would be fun to do a full episode maybe in the next couple weeks as spring training ramps up where we would put together an actual 26-man roster. So yeah, uh, Morgan Haas is the listener. He says, please leave time after your top 25 twins list to assemble. He says an all-time 40-man roster. 40? So we... Ooh. I think we would do tw- like a 26 man <laughs> roster. Do 26. Do Let's do yeah. 26. 26 per. And it would be like a lot of the same guys obviously, but maybe not. Maybe you would we'd have to fill out a bullpen, so we'd there'd be relievers and stuff that yep. aren't on this list that we'd have to bring in. Does Crew play second? Does Crew play first? Yeah, how do you Does Mauer catch? Does Mauer play first? Does or Mauer right play first field base? where he played one game. Does <laughs> bu- does Buxton DH? Yeah. No. <laughs> Never again. But he might play center. If we're taking the peak yeah, version of every no, player, right. Byron Buxton might be the center fielder. Kirby can play right. Boy, and it's then Torrey's, Torrey's out. Because Torrey can't play left. Oh, but Torrey, Torrey could play right. Oh, this would be. Torrey yeah, we right. will do this exercise. <laughs> Actually, you know, you know, cheat code, if you look, there there were a very few times where Puckett was moved to shortstop during games. Yeah. Yep. Puck can play short. I remember that happening one time. I think it happened, it happened in, in Milwaukee, or is it Cleveland? It yes, happened in Cleveland it was an extra in innings game. Yes, and he ended up at shortstop. <laughs> and I want to say it happened again, and I forgot about it, but I found it on Baseball Reference. When they here's a question: When they bring you in for like an extra outfielder, like an extra infielder, so center fielder, come on in here. We need uh, an Fine extra infield. glove, right? Do you get credit for playing an infield inning? How does that work? You know, if you're a, so I know this, if it's a five man infield, I don't know how, cause you're, you're like an extra guy, like a uh, okay. Rover, but, but I know that cause I, I was a big rotisserie baseball league player in the nineties, Puckett going to shortstop qualified oh. him as eligible. Everyone I knew who owned Puckett moved him to shortstop. So only one game would qualify you that. I think the during most the leagues season, have gone like five next. games in season. Yeah. Th- this was during the season. If you moved to a position during that season, you qualified. So, like, the next draft, he's yeah. back to being an outfielder. <laughs> but hilarious. in my league, like, Puckett was immediately moved to short. So this guy had a just unbelievable shortstop. It's always great when you have a guy that kind of sucks at catcher. Like, Victor Martinez used to be a catcher. And then the next year, he gets moved to the outfield or DH or something. But you get to play him at catcher, catcher for the entire geeky. season. Mm-hmm. That's so geeky, but I loved that. <laughs> Yes. So, all right, let us know in the YouTube comment section on the Score North YouTube channel. Click that like button and the subscribe button. How would you rank your top 25 twins? And then we will do a 26-man roster at some point here in the in the coming weeks. And we'll hit you with a Thursday episode. Unless something breaks you in the next 48 hours, we'll hit you with another hot stove roundup and a random twin of the week on Thursday. Thanks for hanging out with us here on the Score North Twin Show.